Maraming maraming salamat po sa malalhating pagbabago wala po sa Lipa Batangas. Sa ating pinakamamahal na Cardinal Vidal, sa ating pinagpipitagan ng host, Archbishop Arguelles, Archbishops and Bishops, mga kaparehan, uh, mga pinuno ng iba't ibang simbahan, evangelicals, at saka <clears throat> Islam, lahat pong delegadong naririto, magandang magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all our delegates, especially those who have traveled from the farthest part of the country, our delegation from Muslim Mindanao, in order to review. And it is my honor and privilege on behalf of all to extend our most profound thanks and appreciation to His Grace, Ramon Arguelles, the Archbishop of Lipa for his great and warm hospitality in hosting this assembly. <clears throat> it is good to be here. These are Peter's words at the Transfiguration. But I'd like to use them as my own and as our own. It is good to be here. Your grace. Why are we here? How did this assembly come about? This is what I shall be talking to you about this morning. With your kind indulgence, I will draw some lines from a column I wrote the other day in the Manila Times. Today we stand at the crossroads of our nation's history. We have traveled far and wide as a people in search of freedom, justice, peace, and democracy. Yet we now face a situation where our leaders have lost, the sight, have lost sight of the common good, where the distinction between right and wrong, between good and bad, between legal and illegal, between just and unjust has been blurred, where moral conviction and religious belief have been emptied of their deepest public purpose and meaning, where government of the people, by the people, and for the people has become more and more of a mirage. Our political and social institutions are in disarray. We are ruled by a rapacious oligarchy operating through a dysfunctional and despotic presidency a predatory social and corporate elite, and unbridled and self-perpetuating political dynasties. Crime, corruption, plunder, political abuse, and invasion of fundamental human rights and liberties are unchecked, except when committed by the wrong parties. What afflicts our politics afflicts our economy even more. Extreme poverty has been nationalized. That is to say, redistributed to become the nation's common patrimony. While the bulk of the nation's wealth has been privatized by and for the oligarchy. Despite persistent claims of high economic growth, Rising unemployment, inequality, and social injustice define the daily existence of our people, millions of whom are victims of long festering conflicts, common curable diseases, and natural calamities. While the poor waste away without the barest of life's necessities, such as food, water, shelter, electricity, education, health care, and basic transport facilities, they less than 1% at the top of the pyramid, led by those on the Forbes annual list of billionaires. Owns, controls, 
and profits from everything. Unprotected from life's adversities, the poor have become the most disposable of commodities. So many of them have lost the will and the power to resist injustice and fight for their basic rights and liberties. Now, despite tireless abovals of providing the nation with honest, dedicated, in incorrupt services, President Benigno Aquino has callously corrupted the Congress, destabilized and intimidated the judiciary, taken over the treasury, misused the police, exploited the military, taken full control of the electoral process, promoted conflict, factionalism, and political enmity in our midst. Beyond all this, he has sought to redefine the various roles of the individual, the family, and the state in a way that challenges all the moral and spiritual values dear to all of us and to our faith communities. He has failed in his basic duties, and yet he now wants the Constitution amended so he could extend his stay and turn the Congress into a permanent tool and the Supreme Court into a rubber stamp of his office. No Filipino head of state before has committed crimes similar in magnitude, gravity, or impunity. And yet various organs of propaganda, through various organs of propaganda, President Aquino has sought to project an image of righteousness in total conflict with reality. These crimes began when the President used the Priority Development Assistance Fund and the Disbursement Acceleration Program to pay off the members of Congress in order to impeach and remove Supreme Court Chief Justice Renato Corona for being an obstacle to his political agenda. The court has since declared PDAF and the DAP unconstitutional, but the president has refused to submit. He has threatened the court with unspecified harm, asked the totally discredited Congress first to enact a law that would legalize his illegal acts, and now to propose constitutional amendments that would constitu constitutionalize his unconstitutional acts. Through his cabinet emissaries, he has assured the complicit members of Congress that they will receive 108 million each in pork next year, where before each merely received 70 million, before the High Court declared the PDAF and the DAF null and void. So the situation has improved so much in their favor. The battle lines have been drawn, and they have been drawn within the Constitution and the rule of law on the one hand, and President Aquino on the other, between the Filipino people and their constitutionally challenged president. Now, no government can exist and command the people's allegiance, which does not rest on solid constitutional and high moral grounds. In our considered judgment, the Aquino administration has lost both of this. We must save our country and our people from the emerging dictatorship. And as God-fearing men and women, we must save President Aquino from himself. You will remember in February 1986, faced with similar questions about the government, the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, led by His Eminence Cardinal Ricardo Vidal, now as Bishop Emeritus of Cebu, who is here with us this morning, declared that if the government does not of itself really correct the evil it has inflicted on the people, 
then it is our serious moral obligation as a people to make it do so. Quote, unquote. We must do the same today. A great moral evil has taken over our government. And it is no longer able to command the people's allegiance, confidence, and respect. It is our duty to restore the moral basis of that allegiance, <coughs> confidence, and respect. However, the government must be redeemed. And for it to be redeemed, it must first be cleansed of its many sins converted and transformed. Conversion and transformation will not come as an unbidden gift from on high. It will have to come from within ourselves through sacrifice, self-giving, and selfless and unstinting service to others, which is the other word for love. But we cannot wait for others to take the first step. We must take the first step even at the risk of becoming leaders in spite of our poor, unworthy selves. So at the initiative of the National Transformation Council, we have assembled here to take that first step. Sovereignty resides in the people and all government authority emanates from them. We must now assert that sovereignty by insisting on our fundamental right to decide what is truly good for ourselves, by rejecting everything that prevents our political and economic life from being rooted in our moral and spiritual union with our Maker and with each other as creatures of a common God. Our most serious problem today is not the future of our territorial boundaries with any unduly assertive neighbor, however important that may be. Rather, it is our basic integrity as a people, conceived in truth, freedom, justice, and peace by an all-caring God. We must now embark upon an honest to goodness and lasting change. Everyone is talking of change, especially the elected politicians. But without a change in man, a change of man would be meaningless. Without a change in the political system, structure, and culture, a simple regime change would yield very little fruit. If in our judgment then, the government has failed, we must change it now. If in our judgment our system has failed, we must not change it. But it must be radical and sincere change. Radical from the Latin radix, meaning root. Ugatin na po natin. 200 38 years ago, on July 4, 1776, 56 brave men from 13 colonies dared to stand against a mighty empire, an empire upon whose shores the sun never set, to proclaim these words. And I quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, government are instituted among them, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect that safety and happiness. There are more than 
56 of us here today. We cannot be less determined than the men from those 13 colonies. We cannot be less convinced that the Spirit of the Lord has brought us here. We cannot be less hopeful of what is in store for us. For the Lord himself has told us in Ezekiel 36.28, You shall live in the land I gave your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. The National Transformation Council was conceived and born in hope and faith invoking the unfailing guidance and protection of the Holy Spirit. The group from which the council sprang was made up of men and women of different beliefs, but of the deepest faiths. They looked at the seemingly unending calamities befalling the nation, both natural and man-made, and they saw that the crisis could no longer be contained by our politics. Beyond the political and economic crisis, they saw a crisis of the heart and the soul, a deeper crisis of conscience and of the spirit. They decided that the only way the nation could survive would be for the people to think together, to reason together, to pray together, to work together. And as the prophet Micah tells us, to do right and to love goodness and to walk humbly with our God. Devoid of many moral and religious moorings, man is bound to stray, to drift away like a lost atom in a random universe, to borrow the image given to us by Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Thus, this group decided to constitute a committee of senior and moral spiritual advisors from the various faith communities, and they are here with us today. However, to allow council members who will receive an erring guidance from this committee to interact with others freely without any undue publicity the Council decided that its membership shall not be made public until it is time to do so. Until such time, every member shall be free to disclose his membership, but his own membership only. He cannot reveal the membership of others. Under this rule, it is my honor and pleasure to announce that I am a full member of the Council and that I wholeheartedly support its program for the entire country. This assembly is the first in a cities. From Lipa, we go to Cebu next month, and then to Sambuanga in October and then to every strategic city, city until we have transformed the country. This is a humble human enterprise, but we place it in the hands of the Lord Almighty. For as the apostle of the Gentiles teaches us, we can plant anything which the others can water but God alone can and will give it the growth. Our people have gone through so much before we came to this assembly. Question is, are we not doubtful? Are we not discouraged? No, we cannot afford it. Does this not look like an impossible task? Perhaps. But the great saint tells us that while others are expected to do what is merely possible, we are expected to do the impossible 
whenever we do things with and in the name of our people in our country. I hope our non-Catholic brethren will not mind if I say that we meet today on the feast day of Saint Monica, that heroic woman who prayed and wept daily for 27 years for the conversion of her son Augustine, who later became one of the greatest saints and doctors of the Catholic Church. To her tearful supplications, Saint Ambrose of Milan, to whom she used to go, finally said one day, Go away from now, from me. For as you live, it is impossible that the son of such tears should perish. Indeed, with all the tears that have been shed before this assembly came to Lipa, it is impossible that this project should fail. With these words, it is now my honor and pleasure to declare this assembly on national transformation open.